it's time to recover from last week, getting very excited about Artemis 1. We've got the next launch window and the booster static fire from Super Heavy. This is tomorrow's space news. Yup, this may all feel like a month ago, but it was only last week. SLS really sucked up some time. Anyways, let's talk about Starship, or I'll try to. With the orange rocket thing happening, the attention has been shifted a bit, and there isn't as much footage as usual to write about, but I'm going to try anyways. First up, fire. This was the first multi-engine static fire attempt of the booster, which may have not gone as planned. As you can see, the first two engines to light had a strong flame very quickly, but the third seemed to have fizzled out a bit. It didn't have the same strong flame as the other two engines. In the early hours of September 2nd, SpaceX removed a Raptor 2 engine from the business end of Booster 7 using their relatively new extended platform. Just a short while after, a new Raptor engine was spotted heading to the launch site, so I think it is safe to assume that the old engine, possibly the one that couldn't hold a steady flame, has been replaced with this new one. It's not just Booster 7 getting new engines though, as one of Ship 24's RVAX has been removed as well. This new one, serial number 115, was seen heading to the suborbital launch site where S24 currently rests. With the grey extensions on, the RVAX remind me a bit of the Saturn V's F1 engines, but let me know what you think of their resemblance in the comments. Starlink has been in the news again recently, with another deal being announced following their collaboration event with T-Mobile. The Royal Caribbean Group, who operate the Royal Caribbean Celebrity Cruises and Silver Sea Cruises cruise lines, have announced that they will be installing Starlink connectivity on all of their existing and new fleet of ships. They trialled Starlink on Freedom of the Seas, the ship which you're currently looking at, which received a quote, tremendous amount of positive feedback from guests and crew. This deal will make it easier for those on board their ships to connect to high-speed internet, which some people may want to do whilst they're sailing to and from their holiday destinations. Expect the Royal Caribbean Group's entire fleet to be decked out with Starlink by the end of Q1 next year. Let's not forget about Crew Dragon though, which has had an important role in returning the USA's capability to send humans to the International Space Station themselves without having to rely entirely on Russia's Soyuz vehicle. NASA announced earlier in the year that they intended to purchase an additional five crew flights from SpaceX, taking them up to Crew 14, and as of August 31st, that deal has been finalised. This takes their missions with SpaceX to 2030, which is how long NASA currently plans to be supporting the International Space Station for. Just in case you missed the conference on Saturday night, Artemis 1 is definitely not launching in September, with the late October window the next realistic opportunity for NASA to hit. There is no official solid word on if SLS will roll back or not, but there is a good chance it will have to. NASA will need a waiver from the range to extend the battery life on the flight termination system on SLS, and that is currently pending. Ideally, NASA want to repair the quick disconnect connection at the pad and then test it with some cryogenic propellant, but if there is no waiver, they will have to roll back and test the system before their next launch attempt. Here are all the launch dates and times, as well as the duration of each window. There are three at 120 minutes, October 19th, 20th and 27th, with a 109 minute window on the 29th and a 108 minute window on the 21st. All the other windows are 90 minutes or less, with a whopping 7 minute window on October 23rd. And just a little one to drop in here quickly, as another Methalox engine has been spotted on the test stand. This is BE4 Flight Engine 2 on the test stand, thanks to ULA CEO Tori Bruno. Just look how amazing the plumbing is, and how clean the engine bell is. Hopefully soon we'll see this fresh engine underneath a Vulcan, heading to orbit. And thanks to Harry Stranger, it appears that an engine has been testing recently as well. The first image is the 26th, followed a day later on the 27th. I'm unsure if this firing was conducted by the engine Tory shared, but it could be. So that's a bit of an update on the three super heavy lift vehicles coming out of the United States, hopefully in the near future. Right now though, it's time for space traffic. First up, another Starlink launch from SpaceX. This was Group 3 Mission 4, which commenced at 0540 UTC on August 31st from Slick 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. 
on board were 46 satellites and they were all successfully delivered to their initial 321 by 308 kilometer 97.66 degree orbit whilst the booster supporting this mission B1063 successfully touched down on of course I still love you approximately 640 kilometers downrange of the launch site. Just a few more kilometers downrange the fairing hearths were scooped up from the water by NRC Quest following their third flight respectively. This launch was followed by one from China, Yaogan 3302, which launched at 2344 UTC on September 2nd. This mission was carried by a Long March 4C rocket from Launch Area 4 at the Xiquan Satellite Launch Center. Because of the payload's type and military remote sensing satellite, this is all we know about this secretive mission. And guess what? It's another Starlink mission, but this one was also a bit more exciting as there was a rideshare on board. The Starlink Group 4 Mission 20 flight commenced at 0209 UTC on September 5th from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. All 51 Starlink satellites as well as the rideshare payload were delivered to an initial 304 by 316 km, 53.22 degree low Earth orbit, but they'll be raising themselves to different orbits over time. The Starlink satellites will be rising up to a 540 km circular orbit, whilst the rideshare payload called Varuna will be raising to a 1056 km orbit. Varuna is a technology demonstrator built for Boeing and it will test out the performance of V band communications with a future intention of building a 147 satellite constellation. Then, before I forget, B1057 successfully touched down on just read the instructions with Doug picking up the fairing halves. Editing Ryan here as the launch roster from the next week keeps changing which means I have to keep re-recording it. First up a Kwajai 1A with Senti Space 1, S3 and S4 from Xpace from Jiguan on Tuesday. On Tuesday we'll also have a Long March 2D with Yaogan 35 Group 5 as well as an Ariane 5 with Utelsat Connect VHTS. The maiden flight of ABL Space Systems RS1 will follow that on Saturday September 10th. Sunday we'll see Starlink Group 4 Mission 2 on a Falcon 9 as well as Firefly's second flight, Flight 2 of their Alpha rocket and then on Monday we may also have another Starlink flight, Group 4 Mission 34. Of course, as always, thank you to the citizens of tomorrow who helped to keep the show alive financially. It'd be a lot harder to make the content you love to see without you. Want to see space new scripts as they're being written? Want to hang out in our member exclusive hangouts? Head to join.tomorrow.tv to join the grand support, suborbital, orbital and escape velocity citizens as well as Neurostream today. There's more to come over the next week though, so don't go anywhere just yet. On Wednesday, Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back with the latest in the world of space weather. On Friday, we'll have a live show and next Monday, I'll be back with more Tomorrow Space News. Hopefully, with a maiden flight to talk about. But for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.